Greetings and good evening, uh, fellow truth seekers. Welcome to lesson five. I entitled the lesson, The House of Yahweh. We'll be looking at 1 Kings, picking up in chapter five, verse 13, where we ended last week, and we'll make it to the end of chapter six, uh, verse 38. I had originally entitled the lesson, The Landmarks of God, because you're gonna see there's a number of landmarks here. And I would argue that even the temple is a landmark, because land, what landmarks do is they really serve to point us to a greater thing. They provide directions to something greater than the thing. And as great as the temple was, uh, it was just a landmark pointing us to a greater reality. But I went ahead and changed the title back to the house of Yahweh, the house of the Lord, um, because that is really what this is about. And so as we move into the lesson, just by way of reminder, the next gathering of the Truth Seekers, my house this Friday, just a few days away, August the 19th, uh, if you have not signed up for food, please sign up as well as uh, vote for the movie that you would like us to watch. Again, those are the four choices, The Atheist Delusion, The American Gospel, Christ Alone, Evolution's Achilles Heels, and The Search for the Real Mount Sinai. Right now, The Atheist Delusion and The American Gospel are really in a very tight race. Um, so if you haven't voted and you have a preference and you're going to be here, please uh, get me your vote. I will seal it up Thursday and we'll uh, get it all queued up for our Friday evening together. Just by way of reminder, uh, sign up for sides. Uh, I'm smoking a brisket as well as a Boston butt and Tim's smoking two slabs of salmon. So we're going to have lots of great food. Uh, so please come. Uh, great fun, great fellowship, great food, as well as we're going to have a good video to watch as well. Just by way of reminder, all the lessons so far for First Kings are up on YouTube. So if you miss one of those, just catch it there. And please continue to pray for our missionaries there in Argentina, the foxes, um, as they minister to the deaf in Argentina. And so last week we had a couple of questions. One, uh, one of the members asked why the King James was different than the ESV that I was reading from. And particularly, in particular, First Kings chapter 4, verse 5 where it refers to Zabud as the son of Nathan, uh, and he was a priest and the king's friend. In 1 Kings 4, 5, in the King James, it refers to Zabud, the son of Nathan, that he was a principal officer and the king's friend. The Hebrew word there is Kohen. Um, here it's translated by the King James authors as... Um, principal officer, but this is the normal word for priest. It's used a total of 750 times in the King James. Uh, 744 of those times it's priest, translated priest, twice own, chief ruler twice, officer once, and principal officer once. And so I would say it really is probably to be understood that Nathan was not only the king's friend, but he was one of the priests as well. I looked at other translations, the New King James, New American Standard, ESV, NIV, RSV, Holman, and others uh, rely on priests. I would say that's probably the best understanding. We had another question, and it was about the threshing floor of Ornon, the Jebusite, uh, when David turned away the wrath of God. And I think the question, if I remember it correctly, and I could be off here, was did the ark, or excuse me, did the tabernacle ever stop there? And was it ever set up there on the threshing floor of Ornon? And as best I can tell, it was not. This did result in, or uh, did result in me doing a study of the movement of the Ark of the Covenant and um, the tabernacle as they entered the Promised Land. So initially, obviously coming in together, ultimately getting split there as Israel was fighting the Philistines. And so what I did, this really resulted in a four-page paper that I put together that traced the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant as they came into the Promised Land in Gilgal, and then really trace their movements, even them coming apart. Um, and again, once they separated, they would never get back together as far as the tabernacle was concerned. It would only be after Solomon built the temple that he would place the Ark of the Covenant uh, back into uh, the Holy of Holies in the temple, not the, tab not the tent tabernacle. But keep your eye on the threshing floor of Ornon today. It's going to come up. And so those are from last week. I just want to touch upon those. And so the house of Yahweh. Last week, we really saw the wisdom of God in Solomon as he established his court. The writer of Kings reminded us of a few things in chapter 4. These included the great happiness and the peace that the nation enjoyed under Solomon's reign. Again, I would have argued that that was principally because of David, 
Um, but still, it's a reality that they enjoyed for 40 years. We saw the sheer size and scope of Solomon's palace, and we were amazed, almost dumbfounded, at the daily provisions it took just to keep his palace running. It was actually breathtaking. Um, but even more than that, we saw, just continued to see Solomon's wisdom. Now, if you remember, um, it was at Gibeon, as the tabernacle was at Gibeon. Again, you can see that there was no Ark of the Covenant there because by now the Ark of the Covenant is in a special tent that David had prepared. Uh, if you remember right after he became king, shortly thereafter, uh, he took the Ark to Jerusalem where it stayed in a tent and it would stay in that tent until Solomon moved it out of that tent into the temple. But at any rate, Gibe uh, it, Solomon took a number of uh, Israelites to Gibeon, and it was there that they offered a thousand burnt offerings. Those would have been offered on the brazen altar, the bronze altar. We don't know how long that took. We don't know what that looked like, but we do know that God appeared to Solomon in a dream. And it was in that dream that God said, quote, ask what I shall give you. Now, in response, first Solomon worshiped God. He thanked God for his love for David and his love, and it was that love that had resulted in him becoming king, him being placed on the throne. And then in great humility, he acknowledged his weaknesses, and then he made his ask. And we see this um, in verse 9 of 1 Kings chapter 3. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil, for who is able to govern this your great people. So there was the ask. In that dream, God had approached Solomon, and in that dream, Solomon responded. Now, God said to Solomon, because you did not ask for a long life, because you did not ask for riches, because you did not ask for the lives of your enemies, behold, and this is verse 12, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind so that none like you has been before you and none like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked for, both riches and honor, so that no other king shall compare with you all of your days. And so we saw the ask, and then God made just an amazing uh, response. Now, what we saw last week is God began to even answer that prayer beyond what we had seen the week before. And we read this in, as we were in chapter 4, verse 29. And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding beyond measure and breath of mind like the sand on the seashore. His cognitive abilities were beyond imagine. The scope of his understanding, his abilities were beyond comprehension, so that Solomon's wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the people of the East and all the wisdom of Egypt. Now, if you remember, I told you in management and leadership courses, they teach you to under-promise and over-deliver. That is not what God does. God does something quite different. God overpromises and then he overdelivers on the overpromise. He gives us above all all that we could think, think, ask, imagine whatever. That's how God works. We also read last week further in uh, verse 34, and the people of all nations came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom. So we ended last week just being amazed that the world was flocking to hear Solomon. He indeed was, to use modern vernacular, a genius. He was beyond Einstein. He was beyond Kepler. He was beyond everyone we think of as genius. Um, he was indeed gifted with God with amazing wisdom, not just in governing God's people, that was the ask, but amazing wisdom in every area of life, flora and fauna. He talked about trees and all these different animals. And here we see nations and even kings wanted to hear his wisdom. And we ended last week seeing that Solomon entered into a peace treaty with the king of Tyre, Hiram, and he, who agreed to assist Solomon with building uh, the temple, in particular, providing labor and trees, cypress and cedar, from Lebanon to build the temple in Jerusalem. And so that's the setup for today's lesson as we pick back up um, in verse 13 of chapter 5. Now, again, as we go there, uh, just again, the focus of the lesson, the house of Yahweh. And before we jump in, one reminder, 
as with every lesson we've done, as we work through these verses, it is amazing to find clear points of application. There's so many and clear pictures of Jesus and the gospel. There's so many. Well, I'll pick up a lot of them, but I, I mean, I'm just scratching the surface. Uh, the surface. It is really loaded with points of application as we tease it out and beautiful pictures of Jesus in the gospel. Okay, so with all that, let's get to our lesson. Verse 13, King Solomon drafted forced labor out of Israel and the draft numbered 30,000 men and he sent them to Lebanon 10,000 a month in shifts, and they would be a month in Lebanon and two months at home. Adoniram was in charge of the draft. So it's a time of peace, and it's now time in God's timetable to build the temple, and Solomon is the man to do it. And here you see Solomon coordinates this massive workforce first by sending 10,000 a month to Lebanon, We'll look at that on the map in a moment. And they would be up there for a month assisting Hiram in shipping these trees down the coast via the water. Um, again, this was all done. We should understand this massive task was done in great wisdom. Now, just as so I don't bury the lead and just to set up something that will come up later. Um, although right now this workforce appears to be done in labor, the idea of forced labor is going to come back up when Solomon's son comes into power, Rehoboam. And so just tuck that away. Uh, the people did not like, at least later on in his rule, the way he drafted so many into forced labor. But you can see what he's doing. He's sending 10,000 a month from Jerusalem all the way to Tyre. Again, about 100 miles as a crow flies. So depending on the route to get there, um, then they're there for a month before they come back home. And so that's what he set up. But beyond that, we read in verse uh, 14, or so he sends these 10,000 a month in shifts, verse 15. Solomon also had 70,000 burden bearers and 80,000 stone cutters in the hill country. Okay, so this is in the hill countries in Israel. These are the people who are quarrying stones, and he has 80,000 stone cutters. Okay, we get that, and 70,000 burden bearers. I refer to these as the grunt labor force. But understand, he's got the 10,000 each month in rotation, the 30,000 total, and now he has 150,000 that are helping in Israel quarry these stones. And if that were not enough, we read in verse 16, besides Solomon's 3,300 chief officers who were over the work and who had charge of the people who carried on the work. So you've got 10,000, 30,000 total, 10,000 in rotation, 150,000, and then you've got 3,300 overseeing, supervisors overseeing the work. I hope you understand and I hope you appreciate the massive scope of this project. And it was only possible because God gave Solomon amazing wisdom. Verse 17, at the king's command, they quarried out great costly stones in order to lay the foundation of the house with dressed stones. We'll talk more about these stones in just a minute. Verse 18, so Solomon's builders and Hiram's builders and the men of Gabal did the cutting and prepared the timber and the stone to build the house. So we see Solomon has this joint workforce, his people, Hiram's people, and these other people, these men of Gabal. Now, these are people from the city of Gabal. The Greek name for that town is Byblos. And this was a town north of Tyre. And so Hiram hired these people out to assist this massive workforce in doing the work that God has called Solomon to do, namely building the house of Yahweh. And that ends chapter 5 and really sets us up for chapter 6 uh, and all that we're going to see in the actual construction of the temple. Now, as we come to chapter 6, we come to a detailed description of the temple that Solomon built. Now, if you're like me, oftentimes when I hit chapters like this in my daily Bible reading, you just read straight through them. Maybe you consider the size of the object in question. Maybe you kind of picture it in your mind. Um, but rarely do you take the time to construct what the writer is writing about. So what we will do is as we read these, we'll attempt to construct the building with as much information as we have so that we have a reasonable snapshot of what it looked like. 
Now, we're not going to be able to sketch the temple. We're not going to be able to draw a blueprint of the temple. But because we believe that all Scripture is God-breathed, given by inspiration of God, and that it's profitable, we are going to take time to understand it, to look for applications, and indeed see if there's any pictures of Jesus the Lord would have us see. In the end, uh, we do desire a picture in our minds of the building that was named the house of Yahweh. Now, again, God is going to provide multiple landmarks in our text. All of these are meant to remind Israel that God keeps his word, that God fulfills his promise, and that God is at work in their world. But for you and I, they remind us of the great and grander scheme that the volume of the book was written about Jesus. It's all pointing us forward to Jesus. So don't miss that. It's all true. It was really a building. It really served as a worship place for Yahweh. Uh, but it, it was pointing to something even greater. It indeed was just a landmark. So let's get at it. Verse 1 of chapter 6. In the 400th 480th year after the people of Israel came out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziv, which is the second month, he began to build the house of Yahweh, the house of the Lord. Now we're given a couple of exact dates here. The first one is 480 years since the Exodus. So the first landmarks we come in contact with involve time. The marking point shows how long Israel lived in the promised land without a temple. So the tabernacle served the nation for roughly 440 years. And all of David's reign, all those, 40, those 40 years, the Ark of the Covenant was in Jerusalem, while at the end, for sure, the tabernacle was in Gibeon. Now, so that you know, some scholars believe that these are not 480 literal years, but should, should be taken symbolically that they represent 12 40-year blocks. I do not hold that position. The natural reading with these dates flowing like this is that these are actual dates, and we should take them literally. Uh, but we're not going to divide over this if someone says, no, no, I think it's just uh, symbolically. Notice it was in the fourth year of Solomon's reign, in the second month, the month of Zib, that they started building the house of Yahweh. So it would have been in the fourth year, the second month of their calendar, which corresponds to our April, May, that the construction on the temple proper began. So to lock this in your mind, Solomon began to reign in 971 BC. So it's about 966 BC, give or take a year, the fourth year of Solomon's reign. And also, as you're thinking about this, taken literally, it does mean that the Exodus occurred right around 1446 to 1447 B.C. So tuck that away in the event we're ever in the book of Exodus, and we'll actually construct all of that out. Still looking at verse 1, he began to build the house of the Lord, fourth year. So again, it is here in the fourth year of his reign that he begins the construction of the house of Yahweh. Um, typically, as we think about the church, we think about a place to worship, a place to gather together. Again, we recognize we are the church, um, but we'll often use it to refer to the building of the place we will worship. But for the Jew, when they talked about the temple or the house of Yahweh, they viewed it more as the dwelling place of God. Now, they knew God couldn't be contained in a building. They knew God was omnipresent, but they understood um, that God had agreed to meet them there, that God would manifest his presence in the Holy of Holies. And so they recognized in a special way that it was the dwelling place of God. Now for believers individually today and the church collectively, we are the dwelling place of God. In fact, let's look at it. Ephesians 2, as Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. You get his point. You were an alien as a Gentile. You're now a fellow citizen. You're now a saint. You're now a member of the house, the household of God that's been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Christ Jesus being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together 
into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So the the Holy of Holies, the temple, this dwelling place of God was all pointing forward. The end game was always the church, the believer, that God was going to dwell in his people and that his people together were this dwelling place for God. But it's important to note, to get back in context, that he began the construction there in the fourth year of his reign. Now, we don't know how much organizing work he did in advance. We don't know what all he collected in advance. We're not told that. But we are told what his dad did in advance. Missed a slide there, forgive me. And so looking at uh, 1 Chronicles 28, 11 through 20 to look at the what David did. Then David gave Solomon, his son, the plan of the vestibule of the temple. We'll talk about that in a moment. Of its houses its treasuries, its upper rooms, its inner chambers, and the room for the mercy seat, the Holy of Holies, and the plan of all that he had in mind for the courts of the house of the Lord, all the surrounding chambers, the treasuries of the house of God, and the treasuries for dedicated gifts, for the division of priests and the Levites, and all the work of the service in the house of the Lord, for all the vessels for the service in the house of the Lord, the weight of gold for all the golden vessels for each service, the weight of silver vessels for each service, the weight of golden lampstands, and the lamps, the weight of gold for each lampstand's lamp, the weight of silver for lampstand's lamps, according to the use of each lampstand in his service, the weight of gold for each table for showbread, the silver for the silver tables, the pure gold for the forks, the basins, the cups, the golden bowls, and the weight of each, for the silver bowls and the weight of each, for the altar of incense made of refined gold, its weight, also the plan for the golden chariot, and the cherubim that spread their wings and cover the ark of the covenant of the Lord. We'll see that in a moment. All this he made clear to me, Solomon would say, in writing, and it came from David's mind. No, it came from the very hand of the Lord. David was collecting things. David was listening to God. David was laying out the plan. So although David was not allowed to build the temple, David was absolutely instrumental in the construction of the temple in that he laid out all of the blueprints given him by God and collected stuff needed in the, the temple. Then David said to Solomon in verse 20, be strong and courageous and do it. Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed, for the Lord God, even my God, is with you. He will not leave you or forsake you until all the work for the service of the house is of the Lord, the house of Yahweh, is finished. Now, just to make a quick point of application. You know, typically when we think of David, we think of a man, a man after God's own heart, we say that, but a man who failed miserably. The thing with Bathsheba that led to the thing with Uriah the Hittite. But we miss a piece of that. Yes, David sinned. Yes, David failed grievously. But David repented. David got back on track with God. David was once again used afresh of God. Although problems came into his house because of his sin, the sword did not depart of his house, the Bible tells us. There was a lot of troubles. But David got, in spite of those troubles, David got back on track. Read the psalm. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, O Lord, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and renew a right spirit within me. David got back on track. And as I told the class, as I think of this, I cannot help but wonder, in a class the size of ours, how many people have that same story? Failure, forgiveness, restoration, and usefulness in the kingdom of Christ. And if you failed God and you've not sought his forgiveness and not sought that re restoration, cry out to God, ask for his forgiveness. He is mighty to forgive. And he will and get back on track with God and be used by God to expand his kingdom until he comes to receive you to himself. But there's another point here as you think about this. Um, and again, I was thinking on landmarks. In the case of the house of Yahweh, uh, the temple, the writer of 1 Kings never tells us exactly where the temple was built. We know it's in Jerusalem, but it doesn't tell us exactly where. Now, the good news is um, the writer of Chronicles does tell us exactly where the house was built. 
Then Solomon, 2 Chronicles 3, 1. Then Solomon began to build the house of Yahweh in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to David, his father, at the place that David has appointed, that David had appointed on the threshing floor of Ornon, the Jebusite. I told you that would come back around this morning, or this evening in this case. Um, it's there on the threshing floor of Ornon on Mount Moriah that the temple would be built. As you think about that, I would remind you it was also in the land of Moriah where Abraham went to found the mountain that God would show him where he was to sacrifice his son, Isaac. Now, God was never going to have him sacrifice his son, but understand he was taking him right to the edge to show Abraham his trust in Yahweh. Um, and so that's exactly what happened. And here's what we read in Genesis 22. When they, that's Abraham and Isaac, came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and he laid the wood in order and he bound Isaac, who was a teenager and could have easily fought but did not, his son, and he laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have withheld your, not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked behold him. Behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. As it's said to this day on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. As you think about this, what a fitting place that there were, David had numbered Israel. The prophet Gad had went to him and given him the choices. He said, I'll fall into the hands of God because he's merciful. And then he, it's there as Gad directed him, he prayed and cried out to God. He built the altar of God, and it turned away the wrath of God from the people. What a fitting place for the temple. And it might even be the exact same place in the land of Moriah on this mountain where Abraham offered up his son, went to offer up his son, offered him up spiritually in his mind. We're told in the book of Hebrews, he offered him up in his mind anyway. It was a done deal. Um, pointing to the reality that God would one day offer up his son, that what I, Abraham was going to do was only a picture of what the father would do. And he would plunge the knife metaf met metaphorically into the chest of his son so that you and I might be saved. It was that location. And what a fitting location for the temple to be built. Now, as you think about all this, it's an easy step to see Davis's, David's sacrifice in turning away the wrath of God as a picture of our David, who would not offer a sacrifice to turn away the wrath of God. He would offer the sacrifice of himself to turn away the wrath of God. What a beautiful picture of Jesus in the gospel. And again, the thing with Abraham and Isaac, the difference is the father would plunge the knife. The difference, just like Isaac was willing to, Jesus, the son, the second person of the Godhead, was willing. You see, this temple stood on that spot. Equally, it stood perched at virtually the highest point on the mountain. It would have been visible for a great distance, providing an amazing and commanding reminder of the grace of God, the holiness of God, um, just who God is. And so this is just an artist's rendition uh, you can see the Solomon's temple here, the complex, the royal compact, Solomon's palace, his house, um, the house of the forest of Lebanon. We'll talk about all that next week. You can see that there, but this would have been at the top of the mountain where the temple was constructed. And again, this temple is a picture ultimately of Jesus Christ, but it's also a picture of believers. Um, just one more point of application as you think about this temple being visible to all men. You and I, as the temple of the Lord Jesus Christ, are called to be that light shining on a hill so that men may see it. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 5, Let You are the light of the world, a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. 
nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all the house. We are that light that's shining forth from that hilltop. What a beautiful reminder as the temple of God. Verse 2. The house that King Solomon built for the Lord was 60 cubits long, 20 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. Okay, so that's the dimensions. I found this on the web. Not sure what that was about. 60 cubits long, 20 cubits wide, 30 cubits high. Now, there are four main structures in the Solomon's temple. The first one is the temple proper. It's divided into two rooms, the holy place here and the most holy place, the nave and the holy of holies, the nave and the inner sanctuary. Um, but as you think about the four main areas or structures of the temple areas, um, this is the first. And again, we're told that dimensions for the temple proper, which this is the temple proper, 60 cubits long, 30 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. Now we'll talk more about this in a second, but it brings us to the second structure, and that's the vestibule. This is on the east side of the temple. It's facing east. The vestibule, if you think about it, it's the front or the entry into the sanctuary. It's 30 feet long. Um, and 15 feet high, um, and again, or, well, that's enough, 15 feet uh, wide. It's the same width as the temple proper. We also have the three-storied side chambers. These are the chambers that go all around. This is sort of a cutaway view here, so you can kind of see them, that they're three levels, and they're located here. Um, these surround the temple on the north, south, and west sides, the temple faced east, and so the side chambers do not run across the face of the temple, but they run all the way around it. And then finally, there's a large courtyard uh, that surrounds the whole structure, and you can see this in 1 Kings 6.36. Now, when we get to Herod's temple, there are multiple courtyards. There's a court of priests, the court of Israel, the court of women, and the court of Gentiles. You don't see that explained in Solomon's temple other than there's this big court. So we're given these basic dimensions of the temple proper, 60 cubits long, 20 cubits wide, 30 cubits high. Now first let's compare that to the tabernacle. The tabernacle was 30 cubits long, so half. It was 10 cubits wide, half. It was 10 cubits tall, one third. So the floor space was quadrupled the floor space of the tabernacle, the floor space of the temple the interior floor space, and that's much taller. If we take these measurements and convert them to feet, the temple proper would be 90 feet long, 30 feet wide, 45 feet tall. Now, as you think about all this, it is not nearly as big as like a pyramid, the Great Pyramid or something like that. No, no kind of size like that. But again, when you think about the pyramid, that's to show off the ingenuity of man. The tabernacle had a different function. It was to show the glory, the holiness, the majesty, and the wisdom of God. It was not meant to show the industry of man, but rather the glory of God. Now, as you think about the tabernacle as a landmark, it served as a landmark for nearly 500 years, 480 um, plus the time it took. Now the temple is going to serve as that landmark. It is going to be the house of Yahweh. It is going to be the house of prayer. It is going to be that bright and shining city, that bright and shining temple in the city of Jerusalem on the top of Mount Moriah. You know, as you think about that, you're thinking, well, the tabernacle lasted almost 500 years. The temple will probably go, gosh, thousands, who knows? Spoiler alert. The temple is going to be completed around 959, seven and a half years after it started. We'll see that here in a moment. And it's going to last until 586 BC when it's destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar's armies. It lasted less than 400 years, around 373 years. Not because it wasn't built to last, but because of Solomon's sin and Israel's sin. 
the temple will ultimately be destroyed. And I'm sorry to po poison the well for you, um, but I do want you to understand. But there's one other thing, there's one other detail that we must not forget from last week. This temple is being built upon the promises of God. God is fulfilling all of these promises that he had made to David, um, that the temple would be constructed by his son, and indeed it is. Now, in a small way, all of these promises were fulfilled in Solomon. But in the grand ultimate way, they're all fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He is the ultimate Solomon. He's the one who's greater than Solomon who has come. He's the one who would set up on the throne of David forever. Um, he's the one through him and through his offering that God will indeed live in us, not just simply tabernacle among us, but live within us. Jesus said it this way in um, John 14, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him. That'd be enough right there. And we will come to him and make our home with him. That's the grand promise that this temple pointed to. You and I are the temple of Christ and God dwells in us. The old, everything this was pointing to, we find fulfilled because of our great savior. Um, verse 3, we're told then about the vestibule, that's that front area, um, in front of the nave, in front of the holy place, and we can see that it was 20 cubits wide, right, the width of the, of the um, temple. It's 10 cubits deep, it's 20 cubits high, so it drops down 10 cubits from the height of the main uh, nave area or the holy place. This is just to give you a picture, an idea, an artist's rendition um, and to show you some things that come up. Verse 4, he made for the house windows with recessed frames. Now, more than likely, these windows were set at the very top. They would have provided light into the temple. We haven't discussed the construction of that, but let me say it now. We'll unpack it. It was all gold, all lined in gold, but there's more to it than that. Imagine what the light would look like as it came in these windows and reflected all over the place in the nave in the holy place. It would have been breathtaking. Um, but again, we're told that it had recessed windows uh, and they had frames. Verses five and six, he also built a structure against the wall of the house, running around the walls of the house. I talked about that, both the nave and the inner sanctuary, and he made side chambers all around. The lowest story was five cubits broad, the middle one was six cubits broad, and the third seven cubits broad. For all around the outside of the house, he made offsets on the wall in order that the supporting beams should not be inserted into the walls of the house. So everything we're reading about now focused on this structure that was not part of the house, but was connected to the house only by beams. So it was an independent structure, but connected. Um, and we saw in the diagram that it ran around three sides of the temple proper. Now this three-storied structure would have provided about twice the square footage from the temple. So the temple had quadruple the square footage of the tabernacle. The storage rooms would have provided about twice the square footage of the square footage of the temple proper. Now we read that the lower story is five cubits wide, the middle story is six cubits wide, and the third story is seven cubits wide, and this is accomplished by offsets in the wall. And so the greatest support is on the lower area, it's seven, six cubits, or excuse me, five cubits, six cubits, seven cubits, with the greatest support being here, then the next greatest support being here, and the least support being on the third floor. So although it's straight on the outsides, it's actually tapered like this because of the offsets. And that's possibly what we're reading about in verse um, six. So imagine this outer structure around the temple. It's three stories. Its width grows as the floor grows up. It has one entry point. It's here on the south side, and then there's stairs to go up. And so that brings us to where we are, and we'll just keep advancing. This is just to compare, to give you an idea of the tabernacle, again, a mobile building, as compared to the temple, quadruple the floor space, three times as tall inside, and this entire storage area that the tabernacle had nothing like that. Verse 7, when the house was built, 
It was with stone prepared at the quarry so that neither hammer nor axe nor any tool of iron was heard in the house while it was being built. Now here we find an amazing detail. They did all of the sizing of the stone at the quarry site so that there was no chiseling, no hammering, no banging, no sanding at the actual construction site at the actual temple proper. So all of the traditional construction noises did not happen at the temple. They happened in the quarry. Imagine the skill it took to cut these massive stones to exacting size and move them in. As you think about how quiet it was at the temple side, it reminds us of a few things, a number of things probably. I'll just grab a couple. It highlights that some of the greatest work in the church is always done in quiet, in secret. Pastor Zach is very vocal, but it takes a lot of quiet work to make his vocal work effective. I'm very vocal in Sunday school, but it takes a lot of support from other members of the Sunday school class to make our class run correctly. And so this just reminds us that some of the greatest work happens in quiet, in the secret. Sometimes people never even know the people who are in the background making sure things are running for the glory of God. Number two, Clark in his commentary brought up an interesting analogy. He said, like the stones were cut, chiseled, and sanded, and then transported to Jerusalem to become part of the temple, the same is true for you and I. It is here on this side of eternity where the cutting is going on, the chiseling is going on, the grinding is going on, the sanding is going on, and it's all in preparation for our inclusion into the new Jerusalem, the temple of the living God. And I would say lastly, just one more point of application before we advance to verse 8, it also speaks to the fact that even in its construction, it was to be a house of prayer. It was to be a house of reverence to God, even as it was being built. Verse 8. And again, there are some commands about cutting and stuff, but, but just take the applications and run with those. Verse 8. The entrance for the lowest story on the south side of the house, I showed you that there on the uh, mock-up of the temple. And one went up by stairs to the middle story and from the middle story to the third, and we talked about that. Verse 9, so he built the house and finished it, and he made the ceiling of the house. Now, this house he's talking about now is this outer structure. And he made the ceiling of the house of beams and planks of silver, so a cedar. He built the structure against the whole house. That's the outer structure, five cubits high. It was joined to the house with timbers of cedar. And so we see that, again, he completes this outer structure. It's roofing uh, these are the same as its flooring in the area above. And that brings us really at this point as we're now going to move away from talking about the, this outer structure to really begin to talk about the temple, verse 11. Now, as we, oh, I'm sorry, we got a little interruption here. I forgot about the interruption. Now, as we come to verse 11, we have an interruption by Yahweh. Now, I'll tell you, when I read this the first time afresh in preparation for Sunday school, what came to my mind was the My Pillow commercial. And forgive me, I guess I watch enough Fox News that I see it a million times. And if you remember, the CEO jumps on, he says, I'm, here, I'm interrupting my own commercial to tell you about these amazing savings. Well, here's what Yahweh does. In the midst of all of the work, in the midst of all of this going on, Yahweh interrupts Solomon's work, interrupts Solomon's building project to make an important announcement to the king. You see, the house of Yahweh is a big deal. It's really a big deal for the nation of Israel. But it's even a bigger deal for Yahweh to interrupt the work to talk directly to the king. Here the writer of Kings tells us that the, it was the word of the Lord that came to Solomon amidst the work. God begins to speak. It was, as I told the class, a divine interruption. One quick thing, that is just like God. God is always intruding onto our agenda to move us off of our plans onto his plans and get us refocused. And I would encourage us to look for interruptions in our day and realize that those interruptions, at least some of them, could be moments where God is speaking into our life. He's bringing someone in our life to speak to. He's bringing something into our life. These are moments with the master and look for his leading. So don't picture these things as interruptions. Picture them as divine moments where God's bringing something into your life and look for how God would want you to respond or handle it. 
Now, in the case of this divine interruption, where God interrupted Solomon, it was really to speak about important matters, in particular, Solomon's heart. Now, I'll be honest with you. It seems like God rarely is focusing on the activity of our hands. Of our hands. He is almost always focusing on the intents of our heart. He is always, almost always focusing not on the appearance, but the heart of the issue. And God interrupts the work to remind Solomon what really matters. And we see this come to Solomon in four if commands that are followed by if then promises. And so let's walk through those. Now the word of the Lord came to Solomon concerning this house that you are building. Here are the three ifs. If you will walk in my statutes, if you will obey my rules, and if you will keep my commandments and walk in them. Now each of these terms has its own unique nuanced meaning, but in this context, I would say they're virtually interchangeable, right? Walking, obeying, keeping his commandments. The point's obvious. God is saying, Solomon, I want you to follow my word. I want you to walk in my ways. I want you to be obedient to me. So that's the if, that's the three ifs. And now that brings us to the three thens. If you do this, then I will, number one, fulfill the promise that I spoke to David. Now, the promise that Yahweh is no doubt referring to is the promise of Solomon possessing an everlasting dynasty. That was the promise. When your days are fulfilled, David, you, and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up of your offspring after you who shall come from your body. I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, this is Solomon, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. That was the first if then. Number two, if then, I will dwell among the children of Israel, if then. Number three, if then, I will not forsake my people Israel. Now these promises to receive these promises, the king must obey God's word. Interesting note, the commands in verse 12 are given in the second person singular. When God says you, he's not speaking to Israel generally. He's speaking to Solomon specifically. For Israel to inherit these blessings, their king had to obey and follow Yahweh. Now, I hate to give you a spoiler, spoiler alert, but here it comes. Solomon failed. He failed completely. He failed miserably. We don't have to go far at all. For, far at all. First Kings 11. We'll just jump down to, I don't know, pick verse 3. He had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to Yahweh his God, as was the heart of his father David. These conditional promises, if we walk them backwards, an everlasting dynasty for Solomon? No. That God would dwell with his people? He did for a time. 722, the northern tribes went into captivity because of their idolatry and sin. 586, the southern tribes went into captivity because of their idolatry and sin. He dwelled with them a short time. I will not forsake my people Israel. He forsook both, he forsook all 12 tribes because of Solomon's sin, because of the nation's sin. In fact, we read this chilling commentary in 2 Kings 23, 27, near the end of the book. And the Lord said, I'll remove Judah also, like I did Israel, out of my sight. As I have removed Israel, I will cast off this city, the city that I've chosen, Jerusalem, and I will cast off the house, which I said my name shall be there, because of sin. The if failed because Solomon wasn't obedient to the then. But I just want to remind you, there's another son of David, indeed a son of Solomon, who is also the son of God, Jesus Christ, who would walk in Yahweh's statutes perfectly. He would obey Yahweh's rules perfectly. He would keep all of Yahweh's commands perfectly. And he would accomplish and secure for us what Solomon never could accomplish and secure for the nation of Israel. You see, the end game was always that the Lord Jesus Christ 
was going to set on the throne of David. The Lord Jesus Christ was going to reign forever. The Lord Jesus Christ was going to secure all the promises of God on behalf of his people. He was the obedient king who would follow the if and win the then. You and I enjoy the promised blessing of God. He will dwell with us forever. As he started now, so will he forever because King Jesus was perfectly obedient to the Father. One more point is just kind of look at this before we wrap these verses up in advance. He never promised that he would dwell in the temple. The promise was, I would dwell among the children of Israel. This was an idea of nearness. And this has been secured for you and I in that he lives within us. He didn't say I would live in the temple, although he did for a time. You see, the ultimate fulfillment was always in Christ. It was always that he would dwell in in with believers when they place faith in him and throughout eternity we will enjoy the promised blessing the promised dwelling god is dwelling in us now and we will dwell with him in his heaven in the future and that brings us to verse 14 so solomon built the house and he finished it he lined the walls of the house on the inside with boards of cedar from the floor of the house to the walls of the ceiling, he covered them on the inside with wood. He covered the floor with uh, boards of cypress. So he lined all of this stone house with cedar on the walls and the ceiling and cypress, a harder board, on the floor. Can you imagine what it smelled like when you walked in this place at this point? So we're talking about the temple proper, and the first thing we learn is that he lined these stones with wood. Cedar, 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 cypress, verse 16. He built 20 cubits of the rear of the house with boards of cedar from the floor to the walls, and he built within, built this within as an inner sanctuary as the most holy place. So this was the holy of holies. This was a 30-foot cube located at the far end of the temple proper. We looked at a few places. This is the most holy place. This is the Holy of Holies, and we'll look at it again here in just a minute. But it was 30 feet long. It was 30 feet wide. It was 30 feet tall. It was a cube. Verses 17 and 18. This house, that is the nave in front of the inner sanctuary, so that's the holy place, the nave, the inner sanctuary, the Holy of Holies, was 40 cubits long, so it was 60 feet. The cedar within the house was carved in the form of gourds and open flowers, all with cedar, no stone was seen. So not only did he line it with cedar, but he started, they carved these gourds and these open flowers in the cedar. So picture this stone now lined with cedar, and then all these carvings there in the nave in the holy place in the cedar of gourds and open flowers. It must have been absolutely beautiful. Verse 19. The inner sanctuary, that's the Holy of Holies, he prepared in the innermost part of the house to set there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. The inner sanctuary, that's the Holy of Holies, was 20 cubits long, 30 feet, 20 cubits wide, 30 wide, 20 cubits high, 30 feet high. He overlaid it with pure gold. He also overlaid the altar of cedar. So after he had overlaid the whole thing in wood there in the Holy of Holies, he overlaid it in gold. So you have stone, overlaid with cedar and cypress on the floor, and all of that overlaid in gold. Um, so that I don't forget to say it. You know, my wife asked a question. She said, we know the tabernacle was such a beautiful picture of Jesus. The temple is too. The temple is too. On the outside, it was a stone building. On the inside, it was magnificent and gorgeous. It was beautiful. This reminds us that on the outside, there was nothing that would draw men to Jesus. There was nothing comely about him. He had no be this amazing beauty. It was who he was. It was the moral purity. It was the inside. It was the core of the person that was amazingly beautiful. Not in the physical, in the spiritual. Moral purity. Uh, moral holiness. Absolutely gorgeous. Outside, quite normal. Inside, absolutely gorgeous. I would remind us it was made of three components. The stone the wood, and the gold together made um, the temple. And it was there in the holy place that they would put, put the Ark of the Covenant. We'll see that in a couple of weeks. But it's all overlaid in pure gold. Verse 21, 
and Solomon overlaid the inside of the house. That's the sanctuary with pure gold. So we had the Holy of Holies overlaid with pure gold. We now have the sanctuary, the holy place, the nave. It's overlaid with pure gold. And he drew chains of gold across in front of the inner sanctuary. So that would be in front of the uh, Holy of Holies. And he overlaid it with gold. And he overlaid the whole house with gold. The writer of Hebrews, or writer of Kings wants us to understand the whole thing is overlaid in gold. Wall, ceiling, floor of the temple proper overlaid in gold. With all the house, he finished it. Also, the whole altar that belonged to the inner sanctuary, that would have been the altar of incense, he overlaid it with gold. So wooden floors, wooden walls, all overlaid with pure gold. Notice pure gold, 24 karat gold. Now, I want you to pay attention to, no to notice something. It's really in verse... Um, 22, I believe, yeah, 22, or 21, I'm sorry. He drew chains of gold across in front of the inner sanctuary. So in front of the Holy of Holies, we're told that he drew gold chains. Now, this could have been multiple gold chains, although we're not told about this anywhere. And so we would probably guess that it's likely not that. This could refer to golden hooks that held the veil that separated the holy place the most holy place from the holy place, that separated the holy of holies from the nave, that separated the inner sanctuary from the holy place. And so more than likely, this was not gold chains, although it could have been. It was more than likely gold hooks that held uh, the veil. Here's what, And so these would have been strung across here, more than likely not golden chains stringing across, but golden hooks that held the... Um, Veil. Now, while we're here, before we uh, look at the verse, again, notice the carvings overlaid with gold, and the gold is hammered to conform to the carving. This would have been absolutely gorgeous. Um, but notice how the writer of Chronicles, indeed, if it was Ezra, describes what's going on here and why we probably don't think this was gold chains, but probably gold hooks that held the veil. In the most holy place, he made two cherubim of wood and overlaid them with gold. We'll see those in just a minute. The wings of the cherubim together extended 20 cubits. One wing of one of five cubits touched the wall of the house, and his other wing of five cubits touched the wing of the other cherub. And of this other cherub, one wing of five cubits touched the wall of the house, and the other wing, also of five cubits, was joined to the wing of the first cherub. The wings of these cherubim extended 20 cubits, Together, the cherubim stood on their feet, facing the nave, facing the uh, inner sanctuary, or excuse me, facing the um, holy place. And he made the veil of blue and purple and crimson fabrics and fine linen, and he worked cherubim on it. So as you bring these together, more than likely, this was not a chain in the way we think of chain, but hooks that held the veil that separated um, the holy place from the holy of holies. Now, the Hebrew word translated chains is only used here. Again, could he have stretched chains? Absolutely. But more than likely, these are hooks that may have been in a chain that were made to hold the veil. Now, whether this was chains, not likely, or the, the chains that held the veil, more likely, they spoke one message. Stay out. You're not authorized to come here. Go away. Sacred place. No one was allowed into the Holy of Holies except the high priest, only once a year on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, and only after special preparation. No other priests were allowed to go in there. No body from Israel was allowed to go in there. Let's be honest, nobody from Israel was allowed to go into the temple proper at all. As If you were a priest and you went into the temple proper to carry out your duties and you saw the holy place and you saw the veil, here's what it said. Stay away. Don't come here. Presence of God. Warning. Step back. I would remind you. <laughs> it is this very veil in Herod's temple, roughly a thousand years from now, when the top, when it will be split top to bottom, according to Matthew 27, 51 and Mark 15, 38, indicating that access to God is now open to everyone. 
This will signify that you and I, because of the blood of Christ, have access to God. No one had access to God. You and I can come into his very presence by a new and living way through the veil, that is through the flesh of Jesus Christ. And you and I have can have boldness to trod where no man has trod before into the very presence of God and cry out, Abba, Father, because of the blood of Christ. And he overlaid the, he overlaid the incense of all, the uh altar of incense with gold as well. It would have been breathtaking. Continuing on verse 23, we read about these in Chronicles. We're now going to peel them apart here in Kings. In the inner sanctuary, he made two cherubim of olive wood, each 10 cubits high. That would have been 15 feet high. Five cubits was the width of one wing, so seven and a half feet uh, of the cherub, and five cubits the length of the other wing, it was 10 cubits from the tip of one wing to the tip of the other, so 15 feet. The other cherub also measured 15 feet tall. Both cherub had the same measure in the same form. The height of one, the height of both was 15 cubits, and so was the other. He put the cherubim on in the innermost part of the house in the Holy of Holies. They would have been behind the veil. And the wings of the cherub spread out so that one wing touched a wall the one wing touched the wing of the cherub, the other cherub, whose wing touched that one, and then his other wing touched the wall. They covered the whole opening, and setting between them, almost as if they were guards, was the Ark of the Covenant. Now, as I told the class, um, I can't imagine what it was like for the high priest that one day of the year, he's going in after he's made special sacrifice, after he has... Uh, gotten fire off the altar after he stripped off the outer garments and he just has the, the white linen undergarments. He has his sash belt. He has his turban and he opens the veil. He pulls the veil back and proceeds into the Holy of Holies with smoke coming off his fire pan. I can't imagine how his heart would have been racing, but now imagine what he sees are these two 15 foot cherubim and in between them as if they're guarding it the Ark of the Covenant. Now, as you think about the cherubim, um, they're mentioned a few places in scriptures just to sort of highlight and pull all this together for you. I remind you after Adam sinned and was driven east of Eden, cherubim were given a flaming sword to guard the entry back into paradise so that men could not go back. These two cherubim are guarding the Ark of the Covenant, which is two cherubim facing each other. That's what's on top of the Ark. For a description of what they look like, I would direct you to Ezekiel 1 or Ezekiel 10. But you can see, overall, they're really just standing as guardians. Uh, they're in the holy place, the most holy place, the Holy of Holies. Um, they were made of olive wood. So here we're introduced to a third wood. We had cedar, we had cypress. Those came from Lebanon. Olive wood came from Jerusalem, and these cherubim were made of olive wood, these giant guardians, and that olive wood was then hammered gold, everything overlaid in gold. And so really to attempt to get a picture of what this might look like, something like that. Again, these cherubim guarding the Ark of the Covenant, everything overlaid with gold, the hammered gold into the wood carvings. It would have been, its beauty would have been absolutely amazing. Verse 29, from the entrance to the inner sanctuary, he made doors of olive wood. The lintel and the doorposts were five-sided. So from the entrance to the inner sanctuary were these doors of olive wood. That's that third wood, the wood that comes from Israel. And he overlaid those with gold also. Uh, the lintel and the doorpost, it says were five-sided. Uh, some scholars believe, and I'll just say it real quick, that that is not really saying five-sided, but rather that they were a fifth of the length of the wall. Uh, that when folded, they took up one-fifth. Uh, we're not sure, again, but that's what scholars believe. Verse 32, he covered the doors of olive wood with carvings of cherubim, palm trees, open flowers. He overlaid them with gold and spread the gold on the cherubim and the palm trees. Now, as you think about this, I don't know when you think about these doors, covered with cherubim, covered with palm trees, covered with open flowers. But what they remind me of is Eden. They remind me of paradise lost. But you know what they should also remind us of? Paradise found. 
paradise regained. Paradise won because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Because the doors have now been kicked open. We have access right into the presence of God. And so these doors that were just another way like the veil of saying, no, go away, stay out, holiness of God, presence of God, you can't come here. Now the doors are kicked open. The veil is torn top to bottom. And the measurement and the and the message now is come, come into the very presence of God. Verse 33, so also he made for the entrance to the nave doorpost of olive wood in the form of a square and two doorposts of cypress wood. Two leaves of one door were folding and the two leaves of the other door were folding. On them he carved cherubim, palm trees, open flowers, and he overlaid them with gold evenly applied on the carved work. So these are the doors that go into the holy place, the nave, the main area of the temple. Again, all of this pointing to the glory, the majesty, the holiness of God, but all of it serving as pictures um, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now think about this. In the tabernacle, they were on a dirt floor. Um, here, they're on a floor of gold. Everything overlaid with gold. Verse 37. And again, this just to go back to the picture, you can see the doors going into the nave into the holy place and the doors that would have also had a veil going into the holy of holies the inner sanctuary oh i lost verse 37. Uh, not there i'll just read it in the fourth year the foundation of the house of the lord was laid in the month of ziv and in the elect 11th year in the month of bull, which is the eighth month, the house was finished in all its parts. According to its specifications, he was seven years in building it. So he started in the second month. He finished in the eighth month. It was seven years and six months to be exact. It was completed in the eighth month of the 11th year of Solomon's reign. What an amazing project. What amazing beauty. In closing, as we sort of wrap all of this up, there was a time when God lived, if you will, in Solomon's house. But his long-range plan, his end game, if you will, is to live in us and for us to one day live in paradise with him. And Jesus Christ went to, a, to prepare a place for us, Calvary that ultimately where he is, we one day will be. So next week, we'll pick right back up here. We'll see the other buildings of the temple complex. We'll see Solomon's house. We'll see the furnishings of the temple. And again, we'll get more snapshots and portraits of the Lord Jesus Christ and the glory of God. The pillars are gonna be awesome. So we'll have a fun time with those until we meet again, uh, either in Sunday school class or here on YouTube. If you miss class, God bless you. Uh, may the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May he give you his peace. See you Sunday.